All right, good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to all the FIX and non fix members to this webinar. This topic is going to be around trading automation, transparency, and regulation, and it was scheduled for the live event in April at Goldman Sachs, but given the challenges with the pandemic, uh, the fixed trading community created a series of educational webinars, and this is the fifth webinar in that series. Um, just some housekeeping items. This webinar will follow Chatham House rules, and this webinar is being recorded. We'll take questions from the audience. At any time, if you have a question, just click the raise your hand symbol. It's on your screen or on your mobile device, and um, uh, we'd like to hear from you. And finally, I'd like to give many thanks to Ion Markets for sponsoring this webinar. And now I'd like to introduce David Polin, General Manager and Head of Product for the Fidesa Division of Ion Markets. David, over to you. Thanks, Deborah. At Ion, we simplify our clients' business by helping to automate their full trade life cycle. We provide tools to help them manage risk and access to liquidity. We provide market data and connectivity to over 350 global venues across every asset. And we process more than $23 trillion worth of transactions every year. We're honored to have recently won the best sell side OMS from Trading Tech. This kind of industry recognition, it helps to validate our position as the leading OMS provider. I'd like to show you a short video showcasing our mission to become your partner of choice for trading solutions, analytics, and infrastructure. Thanks, David. Um, Tom, over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Deb. Thanks, David, for uh, an eye on markets for sponsoring the event and uh, uh, showing us that video. I love the part about the people walking around together uh, in it. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get there. And as Deb said, uh, uh, this is the last panel at the event that was going to be at Goldman Sachs in April. We want to thank uh, Amiko Komoda, who's the co chair of the Fix Americas for organizing that and for Goldman Sachs in, uh, in general. So um, a lot going on in our world today. Uh, uh, the big thing is I hope, you know, you and your family stay safe. Um, the good news for our sector, though, is that business, uh, business goes on, but not without challenges. There's not a day go by that we don't see something about restructuring or downsizing. The overall focus in terms of improving productivity, uh, lowering cost. And FIX is a key part of that. Uh, the, the markets wouldn't be trading uh, uh, without FIX, and FIX keeps expanding into post-trade all the way down, uh, new asset classes, digital assets, uh, repos. So it continues to uh, expand to make it more productive for our industry. 
Today, we're going back to our core, to our legacy business, uh, equity, uh, equi equities, and talk about some of the efficiencies that are going on in that, in that uh, market. And uh, I'd like to start by just asking every panel, each panelist to um, just introduce themselves and, you know, uh, uh, just tell us what you, what you do at your firm, right? So maybe, Brian, we'll just start with you since uh, on my picture, you're up on the top left here. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm Brian Lees. I uh, am uh, an equity trading uh, technology solutions manager at Capital Group. I've been with Capital Group for 23 years. Uh, started out doing development work on uh, equity trading and uh, have uh, since moved on to managing uh, a large team that uh, builds our own uh, custom equity order management system. and um, we work very closely with uh, trading desks. So we have trading desks uh, globally uh, in the US uh, and London and in uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. And uh, so our, our team is responsible for providing all of the uh, technology solutions for equity trading. Okay, um, uh, Rosalind? Uh, yes, uh, uh, my name is Rosaline. I've been at Goldman for, for five years. Um, straight out of school, I have a PhD in stats from Columbia. So we're starting at Goldman back in 2014. I started in the securities lending business and I've been in, and then I moved over to electronic trading about two years ago. And what I do in electronic trading is I'm specifically focused on improving execution quality for our clients. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ari? Hey, my name is Ari Galwin. I'm a product manager at Barclays uh, Equities Electronic Trading Group. I focus on um, our internal trading systems, international algos, client connectivity, vendor relationship management. And I also work very closely with our internal salespeople and clients to customize solutions to meet uh, our clients' needs. Great, thanks. Uh, Enrico? Enrico Cacciatore at Fuoya Investment Management. I'm a senior, senior quantitative trader, uh, and as well as our head of market structure and trading analytics. I think I get a unique pers perspective because I'm a practitioner, but also looking at our transaction costs and our analytics to better understand the entire life cycle that, uh, of, of the trade. Okay, and uh, David, who we met before. We service over 200 brokers across 23 data centers, 600 buy sides, uh, 6,000 buy sides, excuse me, and uh, 600 brokers connected into that network. Okay, well, thanks. Um, let's start with a polling question. And uh, the polling question um, is uh, really focused on the buy side, but I'd like to ask everyone who has knowledge of the buy side, you know, you buy side your customers or you're a vendor to them, if you'd answer the, uh, if you'd answer the question also. So Deb, if we can put up the first polling question about uh, uh, execution quality and the evaluation of brokers. Absolutely, the first question is, do you incorporate variants of execution quality in the evaluation of brokers? Yes, no, or sometimes? You can vote now. Okay, Tom, I'm going to show you the results. Great, thank you. Yes, no, sometimes. Wow, okay. Uh, uh, all right. Um, why don't um, uh, uh, we uh, ask the uh, buy side, um, and that, that's one of the factors, obviously, in making decisions. But let's start with the uh, asking the buy side about um, how do you make decisions uh, on order routing strategies and brokers that you uh, brokers that you use, right? So, Brian, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Uh, so that is something that has uh, evolved over the last 20, 23 years that I've been involved. Um, you know, originally it was. Uh, much simpler, uh, you know, everything was done by phone and then with the uh, advent of FIX. Um, originally, our goal in, in building up the technology to support uh, order routing was um, 
just to enable as many pools of liquidity as, poss as possible. Uh, and over the years, in, new things have arisen, you know, that we went from uh, you know, just dealing with uh, cash desks to then having algorithmic options and then uh, crossing networks and then broker ATSs. And so all along the way, we've been adding more uh, capabilities into our equity OMS to uh, make it a platform for uh, launching uh, orders uh, or Piecing, piecing up orders and, and uh, accessing all of those different pools of liquidity. Um, so it originally, you know, the, the goal was to make tools available and then allow the traders to access those tools and make decisions about how and when to route to those different pools of liquidity. Uh, now, now that we've got all that in place, um, you know, the, the idea of um, refining that and helping them um, further automate that process is, is what we've been more focused on recently. Um, but what we provide currently, uh, you know, in addition to the, uh, you know, the EMS type capabilities to access those pools of liquidity is, um, you know, we've collected a wealth of data because as you know, over the last several years, we've, thought we've been um, very active in fix and trying to promote consistency in the data that we're receiving. And so, um, we're now using that data to evaluate the effectiveness of, of where the, the um, traders are sending their orders and providing that to them so that they can incorporate that into their decision making. Um, but what we're finding is that that's a lot of information. You know, because we, we do a lot of trades, we deal with a lot, of, a large number of brokers, and there's a lot of analysis coming back to them. Um, remembering which broker is most effective or which algorithm is most effective in a particular situation is difficult to remember, you know, in the, in the heat of trading. And so uh, we're turning our attention to how can we pull all that together, in, you know, into one platform that um, makes recommendations to traders and allows them to make decisions on the fly, you know, with the support of technology. So it was a lot of the decisions um, uh, with the data, uh, uh, post-trade data uh, analysis, or are you trying to move it to more real time? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, originally it was, was post-trade. I mean, we, we do send data out uh, for TCA uh, to external firms to do TCA for us, um, and as well as doing some of our own calculations. Um, but um, we're um, also, you know, because we're collecting a lot of that information in real time, you know, the tag 293851, you know, which was the focus of the execution transparency initiative, uh, we've now built a tool that, that traders can uh, sort of x-ray their orders in real time and show what markets they're, the broker is accessing on their behalf, um, whether or not they're crossing the spread to, to uh, get orders done, how much is in the dark, how much is in lit markets, things like that. So we do have now have that available and available to be graphically displayed. So for the, the orders that require more hand-holding, they, they have real-time tools available them, to them to see how the order is accessing the market and um, what influence it's having on the market. We chart uh, you know, our fills against the overall market, so it's easy to see the reaction of the market to what we're doing. And, and easy to see how much of the market we are because we're showing our prints versus the overall market. And so it's a combination of both um, uh, analysis in real time of that data that's flowing in as well as, um, you know, post trade analysis that is regularly provided back to the traders to, to uh, evaluate the, the effectiveness of what they did. Um, great. Thanks. I'm going to ask uh, Enrico the same question. Uh, Deb or Rosalind, um, I don't know about the others, but Rosalind is sort of tilted sideways on our picture. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. So, thanks. That's great. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, Enrico, um, uh, same question for you. How do you make decisions on where you're going to route to and what brokers do you use and which brokers do you use? Yeah, that's a good question. The polling question, too, is um, interesting because you can look at it in different perspectives, right? 
Um, I think well, our, the real focus at uh, Voya uh, is is really understanding important, and I think the buy side needs to do a better job of this. Is really understanding the intention of the order. What's the expectation, right? Well, whether it's a pre-trade analytic or whatever decision might be, because especially at Voya, we have a you know we have a quant group, and then we have fundamental active, and the order sizes uh, vary quite a bit, right? So, and then you know, what's their benchmark? What are they trying to do, right? And understanding that, because if you don't have a, tr a true understanding of what your intention, what your expectations are, how can you evaluate that? And how can you determine the optimal routing strategy? So from a quant perspective, typically the orders are you know, executed within one day, and there's a fairly discrete um, understanding of expectation, right? Uh, and from that, you know, we, we, our routing decision becomes much more simplistic, uh, especially if it's a schedule type of strategy where we have a duration and, and we can evaluate the broker um, or brokers over time, um, you know, very uh, quantitatively, right? And that variance gets incorporated because one is uh, we're using maybe an algo wheel, right? That uh, incorporates the, the uh, a random forest decision tree. So, so the sampling should take into account that variance that we talked about, you know, that standard deviation, especially if it's a scheduled uh, type of algo. Now the part that becomes interesting that really we're, we're really focusing in on uh, is, okay, liquidity seeking. How do you measure that? Right. And that's where volatility impact, uh, and, uh, time decay becomes in question, right? Because one broker's IS medium or liquidity seeking medium may be drastically different than another's or, uh, or the expectation from the buy side seeking that liquidity. So I think what we're really trying to do is sort of kind of work with the, the sell side to better define our expectations and therefore be, be able to better measure. And then from that, We'll be able to make a better decision and 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 how you know how we view that. And I think that I think the the, the point to take away is from especially any buy side and and I'm sure uh, Rosalind and Ari um, could have some great feedback on this is from from a from a non scheduled uh, algo say liquidity seeking IS dark. How would, you know, how would you envision a way to, for the buy side to represent their sort of tolerance of, of time or expected cost, Z-score, uh, theta, in, in, a, in a standardized method to where we can sort of standardize, standardize um, that, therefore, the sell side is no longer sort of trying to optimize every client based on what they view as tolerance to time or expected impact. So, you know, I think that's sort of really where we're focusing in on. Tom, I think uh, you're muted. Uh, yep. Um, Rosalind, uh, so what is the sell side doing to, uh, you know, as we said, there's, there's a lot more coming from the buy side. Buy side's more aggressive toward the sell side. How is the sell side responding? What's some of the things that's going on in the electronic trading uh, initiatives? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I'm saying, based on like, what Brian and Enrico have said, so uh, the type of flow that we receive can be either, let's say, self directed or like coming in a wheel from like the buy side. So regardless of the way we are receiving the, the orders, we, we have. Let's say the way we look at it is pretty like, I would say the approach is very similar, right? So one of the first things that we're always going to do is to try to understand the client object objectives, right? So how the client trades, what are the clients, what are the benchmarks for this particular, this particular flow, right? Because we need to, we need to know exactly how, given the, the different type of like algos that we have, what is the best algo for instance for this, for this particular flow and how, what should we do in order to meet the client, to meet the client objectives? 
So those are like some of the first that we're going to do. And then we're going to spend a lot of time really like understanding the client flow, right? So we, because they have different, some clients have different, like very different type of flow. Some people like trade, like they have a, a very long trading horizon where they can look at like, oh, my trade is really like over a multi-day or I trade like my, or I should just think about this like an intraday type flow. But overall, what we're going to do, we're going to use like transaction cost analysis to measure the existing quality after it's done like the proper algo customization. The other transaction cost analysis is going to help us do is going to help us first, of course, measure the exhibition quality. It's also going to help us know how and where we're writing our orders, right? So how we are sourcing liquidity, because those are the factors that will help us like better improve like our trading, like our better improve like the customization of the algos. And there are, there are also other things that we also do on the sales side is like one experiment for instance, so that so that we can say, okay, this is the way this is, I received this flow. Uh, I have I have a couple of ideas. I think the, the ideas are very interesting and might work. But how do I actually go and test those ideas, right? So, and one way of doing that is to run an experiment. And the way to analyze is always like done on like not only intraday when the flow trades, but also like on the post trade analysis using TCA. Yep, a lot of uh, a lot a lot of work there. Uh, Ari, how about uh, yes. uh, uh, Barclays? What are you uh, What are you folks doing? Hey, Tom. Yeah, so um, you know, sort of like going off of what uh, you know Brian and Rico mentioned. I mean, obviously, there's a tremendous focus uh, on on the outcome uh, of from a from a trading standpoint, from a performance standpoint. Um, the buy side has many more analytical tools uh, to 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 look at this more so than they had in the past. Um, as uh, Rosalind mentioned, the algo wheels are becoming much more popular. And so the buy side is able to better bucket broker flow and, and analyze it more efficiently. Um, and and you know, I've seen actually when, when we get requests for um, to enable buy side flow via wheels, very often when we talk about what strategy the buy side may want to use, the, the answer we'll get is, well, you know, you guys pick the strategy we're less interested in what strategy you use and more interested in what the outcome is. So you just make sure you, you know, you're putting your best foot forward in terms of the results. Uh, and that's really what the focus is. So with, with that, with that, you know, sort of uh, um, backdrop, <clears throat> we're, you know, we think it's really critical to have a, you know, a highly innovative and customized platform to be able to meet the needs of our clients. So, you know, obviously we're always working on tweaking the algos and our order routing logic to improve performance. But I think that's sort of like, you know, business as usual. I think everybody, is constantly doing that. More significantly, we're actually altering our entire algorithmic framework from a collection of individual static rule-based algos to a single based algorithmic platform called Barks One, which is essentially a single algo, highly parameterized and, and signal driven. And this, this platform has, has um, uh, a number of advantages. So first of all, it, it will allow us to be very innovative um, and be able to respond to our customers' needs um, in a very, very quick, quick manner. Um, it also allows us to run experimentation on the algos in a more efficient manner because we're dealing with just instead of having to experiment across, you know, 9, 10, 11 different algos, we're dealing with just one single um, highly parameterized algo framework. You can tweak different components of it and be able to run, you know, a, a lot more experimentation and see if the results are in a more, in a more seamless manner. Um, in addition, we're very focused on um, within this framework on signal research, you know, short-term price indicators and which ones are relevant, which ones may not be as relevant anymore. And so there's a continued focus by our analytics team uh, on those inputs into the algo. And what we're thinking about maybe down the road in the future is for clients that have their own proprietary research around signals to be able to incorporate that and drive the algos themselves um, you know, through, through some sort of API. So that, I mean, that's a little bit down the road, but that's kind of you know, where we're thinking from from that standpoint. And the, and the other advantage to the framework is that it just much, it's much simpler, it improves stability, it's much easier for the buy side to, to understand what's happening on our end. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a main focus for us. Uh, related to that, and, and Rosalind alluded to this as well, is, is around the TCA front and transparency. So, um, you know, looking to build out a more customized TCA framework to complement the, the external TCA providers, but they were able to provide 
clients the ability to run their own TCA in a very, very customized manner and also very actionable. So to be able to, you know, leveraging the Barks One framework to be able to look at the different parameters that are being used and how those are, those are potentially driving their performance uh, and then, you know, you know, work with, with us and with the clients to, uh, to make tweaks for that. We also, from a transparency standpoint, very focused um, on our Specs product, which is a client portal um, that allows um, clients to view their, their settings within Barclays. So whether it's, you know, which venues they currently are entitled to, what their risk limits might be, uh, et cetera. That's a product we've had for a few years now, and we continue to focus on that and make sure that clients are leveraging that. Um, as well as, you know, working with, uh, with Enrico and the buy side around transparency initiatives um, and just trying to be as helpful as we can and help our clients in any way we can. And then I think the last thing that we're focused on um, is around um, uh, principal liquidity. I think uh, one of the ways that the sell sides can, can distinguish themselves is the unique liquidity that they have and that are able to offer to their clients from a principal liquidity standpoint. So we are, are doing that via our Capcom product, which is embedded into our algos and allows clients to opt in to, uh, on their algo order flow to have a portion of that executed versus, versus principal liquidity within Barclays. So we'll continue to focus on, on the, the Barclays One framework on the TCA and transparency and around um, clients ac accessing principal liquidity. And Tom, if I can have one minute to, uh, based on what Enrico said, um, on like having the buy side, for instance, send us like some, in, like at least some ideas on like, oh, this is maybe a flow that has this amount of alpha, or maybe this is the way, I think this flow should be more aggressive. This is, this is something that we've, we've, we actually we're starting to see a little bit more of, of like client having a sense of like, urgency in their own flow and therefore if we on our side can have that information the way we can customize the flow will definitely change right because if you look on the sales side we although we try to understand the client flow in a very general fashion and also like go into detail to see what they're trying to do is still the client really knows what the in like what the final objectives are so but if we have that information the way we can customize the algo will be very, very, I would say like much more efficient, right? So we can kind of like, if we receive that, the, 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 the client will not, at least the buy side will not have to tell us that, oh, I have X amount of alpha in, the, in this flow, but they can tell us like, this is like a certain level of urgency I'm expecting for this life, for this specific set of orders. And once we have that information, the way we customize the algo is going to change. So that is also something that we, that at least we're starting to think a little bit more. Wow. So, um, uh, David, uh, uh, some of your clients are not the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Goldman's or the Barclays of the world in terms of the algos. And you listen to all of those uh, things that Rosalind and Ari talked about uh, doing. Can you talk about how you uh, help the people that are not small firms, but you know what I mean? Uh, not the Goldman's or the Barclays or the Bammels of the world and, uh, and how your service helps, uh, helps them. Uh, uh, do their work? Sure. I mean, it's actually, it's an interesting question to kind of unpack a little bit because uh, one of our recent initiatives, and I think this is industry-wide, you try to use a regulatory change which forces you to collect new data, and then you try to, to, to get an ROI on that. You try to say, well, now that I have this data, what can I do with it? And so, obviously, with CAT and the 606 changes, there's a lot of data that didn't exist before. So previously, we were looking a lot at trade execution for TCA. Buy sides were relying on fixed messages quite frequently. Now with 606, there's a tremendous amount of routing information that's suddenly available to the buy side that wasn't available before. For example, a blind ping of an internal liquidity pool, something you may have opted into on BarkX, you now get to see how many times that occurred, whether it filled or not. So that data set is something that on behalf of our clients, we've put into a historic data, uh, database. We make available via a REST API every event in the order lifecycle that we can capture, including route events. So that's important to our clients because it builds trust between the broker, who's our client, and the buy side to experiment and make change. And if you can share that data set between the buy side and the sell side, that trust enables consultancy and partnership. So one of the ideas we've been talking about with our clients is do we want to expose that REST API to the client, so that in, to the buy side, so that in real time, they can see across all Fidesa brokers, 
this information around how route events and the order life cycle has occurred from the cell side perspective. The second aspect of it is to make it, that's a searchable aspect. The second aspect is to make it actionable. There, we recommend to our clients that, I mean, maybe it's worth an example quickly. The last week of February and March were the highest volume month we've seen in the markets. Five of the top seven volume days occurred during that time period. And I think on the whole, the industry was amazing during that time, coping with that kind of volume. Retrospectively, one of the things that we've done, and I know people like Goldman's done, maybe Roslyn is involved in this, is we've looked at a priori, you would expect volumes to shift to high touch as the buy side leverage sell side expertise during volatile and high volume times. And you'd expect more aggressive tactics because the buy side would say, we'll trade market impact for market certainty. And what's interesting is that did not happen. Proportionally and percentage wise, trading stayed the same in terms of low touch. It stayed the same in terms of aggression. And I think one of the reasons that that occurred and an opportunity that was missed for short-term alpha in March is we didn't have the data searchable, actionable, and we didn't have it shared with the buy side for trust. So one of the things we recommend to our clients is whether they have their own algos or they're using other broker algos is they put an algo wheel in front of it. It sounds not dissimilar to, to BarkX in some, in, some, uh, in some ways, taking in real-time signals that can be provided by the, by the clients. Um, and fundamentally allowing us to experiment uh, on a trust and consultancy basis because we're sharing data in terms of should we shift more flow in real time to the low touch desk? Should we use an epsilon greedy strategy around the aggressive tactics? And that in the end should allow us to see in March or a month like March, more optimization, faster optimization of how we aggress a volatile market or an unusual market and therefore more short-term alpha for our clients. So, so I guess in summary, it's about searchable and actionable data, which sound like buzzwords, but, but hopefully that chain makes sense as to how they're used. Yeah, the, uh, the whole uh, data and uh, customization um, is not buzzwords because everybody on the panel used it, right? You know, there's more data and people are using it and they're customizing it for uh, for firm uh, for firm needs, so it's a. Uh, uh, I, I want I wanted to, there's so much to talk about and what you what you folks just talked about, uh, but I want to do one more poll because uh, it has to do with data, uh, also, um, and it has to do with if people are using uh, tags uh, uh, 29, 30, and 851 um, on that, and again same rules I gave before. You know, uh, even if you're not on a buy side, if you can. Uh, knowledge of the buy side in terms of, uh, you know, tag 29 is the, you know, last capacity, you know, whether you uh, did it as principal or, or, or uh, uh, cross tag 30 is last market uh, and then tag 80, 851 uh, is uh, last liquidity. So if we can put that poll up uh, on, on that and then we're going to talk about uh, the results of that poll and then uh, some of the items in terms of overall transparency. Okay, so the poll question is up. We urge everybody to vote. How are you utilizing execution transparency data, fixed tags, 2930 and 851? You've got five multiple choices. And just so the panel knows, once we get the results up, I'm gonna ask you what you, is that your experience, right? And then maybe tie it in a little bit to, um, you know, we uh, uh, David talked about uh, 606, right? Which is, uh, brand new rule that is in effect now uh, on that in which people are given a, you know, all side has to give a little, lot of information, a lot more information back than they did before. Maybe Voyeur and Capital Group got all that information before, but the rest of the world didn't necessarily get it. So I'll tie it in together. So, uh, so I don't receive it or uh, don't retain it, 3%. Uh, I use it for post-trade, 28. Oh my gosh, I both display it in real time and use it for post-trade TCA CSA. So uh, it's used pretty uh, pretty extensively then. So I'd like to uh, ask the panelists if um, what their thoughts are on, on, on this and also maybe tie in the, uh, the 606 question to it. Uh, you know, do you find that that's gonna be 
uh, valuable also. So Brian, why don't I why don't I start with you on that, and then I'd like to go, I'd like to get comments from uh, everyone on the panel on overall on yeah, uh, like information like this. Yep. Yeah, it's um, first of all, it makes my heart happy to see that uh, <laughs> more than half the people are <laughs> using it in real time and in post trade. Um, yeah, your bonus, uh, your, you know, your bonus is based upon the amount of people that use those tags. So. <laughs> my, my six membership card depends on it. I think it'd be revoked if uh, people weren't using this after all these years of uh, uh, putting out guidelines and uh, you know working with brokers to get that consistency going. So I'm very happy to see that yeah that's being used in, in um, you know at least uh, post trade and I guess in some in a fair number of cases uh, real time as well. Um, it, um, you know, how this relates to 606, I, I mean, um, 606 obviously creates a higher level of obligation on the broker side to, you know, collect accurate data and make it available. Um, but having said that, I mean, we've been pushing for this type of thing for years, and we've even talked about, um, you know, collecting routing information even before the RTI uh, initiative uh, you know, that, that's been a topic of conversation. Um, pretty sure Ari's been involved with that conversation with me for many years. Um, so it's, thing, it's something people have been thinking about, and I know on an, on an ad hoc basis, they're only been asking brokers for that kind of information from time to time, you know, when they want to do their own type of analysis. So from my perspective, 606 hasn't really changed things significantly. It's just sort of, um, you know, uh, like, like I said, raised, it, raised that to a higher standard of, um, of uh, you know expectation, you know that the brokers are doing that. Um, but I think that expectation has always been there from the buy side. So, um, other than you know maybe broker putting a, a little bit sharper focus on how they're collecting the data, I, I haven't really seen a big change, you know, due to 606. But be interested to see, you know, what Ari and Rosalind think, you know, from their perspective on the sell side on that. Um, Rosen, you, <laughs> Rosen, you want to go first? I'll let Harry go first on this one. Okay, thanks. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, uh, Brian, first of all, I, I kind of share the same sentiments as you in terms of seeing that poll number because I've always wondered, you know, uh, yeah. and, you know, obviously it's a small sample size, but still, it's at least at least it's a data point where you see that. Uh, the work that, that people are doing to provide greater transparency is actually being used um, in a productive manner and not just sort of a, a check of the box of, yeah, we, you know, we get, we get this data. So um, it's, that's actually really encouraging to, uh, to see that. And, and Brian, I think, I think I agree with you on the 606. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of transparency and just trying to provide additional information, um, you know, these are things that, you know, we've been doing for a while and continue to do. I think the 606 will be interested to see that, that same, if we put that same poll question up in uh, a year from now to see, you know, what clients are actually doing with it. Um, you know, if we, if we get that high number, will be, will be, uh, be nice to see as well. But uh, I guess time, time will tell with that. But yeah, it's definitely encouraging. And I think, you know, I think we're all open to, to transparency and trying to um, uh, provide as much information as we can. Um, so that uh, people are aware of what's going on and, and how we can improve the process. Rosa? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you both. <laughs> Not very much to add here. And to be honest, I was also very happy to see the, the result of these like poll questions. So 52% and 28%, I was like, wow, that, that's interesting, especially the 52%. Small sample, but still good to know. Um, I, I, I just, I think on the sell side, We've been very, very transparent with our clients. So the, the new rule is, is not going to change that. So it, it's, okay, it's just, it's just putting like rules around like what broker needs to do, but it's something that they've been doing for a while anyway. So how clients and how the buy side are receiving that information and processing and using it is something that will be interesting for me to know too. Enrico, what do you think? No, I think, um, I mean, I think it's been critical for, for a long time. And I think we can do kudos to everyone for getting 29, 30 and 851, um, you know, utilized as, as, as a, as transparency and data. 
Um, I think still we need to do, do a better job. I think uh, from a buy side perspective, I think s- some of the standardization, especially around ISO and, and, and tag 30 value values and 851 need to improve. And I think we're fix, fix has uh, done a great job of trying to help improve that. Especially in 851, I think if you're taking an 851, you probably need to be taking a, 93, a 9730, which is a raw exchange codes, right? Because in some cases, yeah. um, you're not truly, you're, you're getting a normalized value versus what actually is happening at the exchange. So, so, um, you know, I think there's improvements there and especially in dark, you know, if you're in a uh, ATS, well, you know, uh, some, of, some of 851 is still ambiguous and, and we can do a better job with that as well. As far as 606, I think, um, especially if you're a, a smaller asset manager, it's, it's, it's a nice to have it forces uh, your brokers to actually, you know, evaluate the data and push that data. But I think if you're collecting this sort of information and sort of my pursuit with uh, RTI and routing transparency initiative, it will provide more value as un- in understanding because if you're looking at say uh, tag 29, tag 29 values um, and, you know, is, is there a, a, a conflict with economics and best execution, you're not really gonna know from 606. And I think uh, Reg ATSN will give you a lot of understanding of conflicts of interest, if, if there's any with a certain, certain relationship or partnerships with, uh, with say uh, a venue or, or uh, a market maker that maybe you're not normally aware of and it'll be made public. 606 provides that information, but if uh, Reg ATSN can uh, provide even further information. So I think overall we're going in the right direction uh, because the first part of uh, the subject line of this is about automation. And I think to, to improve automation, it's really about understanding the transparency, transparency of the process, as well as um, of uh, understanding the regulatory landscape and, you know, you know, and making sure regulation uh, helps in the best execution is not a hindrance. Great, uh, David. Any thoughts? No, I think. I mean, I think obviously we've been working on the execution reports and the information in them for a while, and it's. I, I'm just going to echo sentiments. It's great to see that they're used because we've all put a lot of effort into them to make sure they're accurate. I agree that the more raw data is a good supplement, whether you're under the liquidity indicator or into the market indicator, because there's always further detail. It's nice to understand how the route aways work. So I think you know one of the challenges we've had with uh, analyzing this data can be when you're out to a broker, but that broker is just the beginning of an execution chain. So how do you pull all that data together across the whole execution chain? And I do think, and I think it's something Rosalind brought up in the, when we met before the panel, that there's a question of intent that would be nice to be able to capture. And I think I saw that um, Enrico, you and, and Catherine Zhao on the RTI initiative, uh, Catherine from Cantor, we're looking at different techniques to try to capture that intent. And I was interested in that as well. Um, I do worry sometimes we overload fix with a little bit too much post-trade data and there's a better way to approach some of that that detail. But uh, I guess I'm just echoing previous sentiments. And um, just to jump in on that, what you just said is a critical aspect of, uh, well, Transparency and RTI or anything that I know Goldman Sachs has a new liquidity uh, indicator of how, when when you trade principally who did you interact with right and uh, that's in a that's in a custom tag uh, but one of the big things that we've done um, um, is basically work RTI and partner with a, a project called Project Broncos and, and essentially you're drop copying all your fixed data into a cloud environment that's um, uh, that's also has perimeter security because it's being built by Microsoft Navadov, but also it has encrypted. So it, you, you see it an encryption key within every fixed message. Uh, and so now all this fixed data doesn't have to go basically uh, back upstream through the broker or to the OMS. Essentially all this data can get, dropped into a container and then you can create an API to access all that information. And the other thing too is with RTI is using simple binary encryption and it simply goes into two fixed tags. So uh, 
within that it's machine readable and it's very detailed information, but it's minimal overhead over fix. So, you know, the, the data is not there, but also uh, a lot of brokers concerned of, Oh, in real time, if I have an intention codes, you know, how do I process it and send that at the same time that I'm sending back all my executions. And this way, it, it, it you know, it, it simplifies, it simplifies that, um, it, you know, using um, a fix a, you know, a, a fix a, a drop copy. That's not, doesn't have to be TCP. It's, it, it would be more of a UDP because there's no late, you know, there's no latency concerns because you're going to be looking at, it's not at, you know, at near real time versus uh, real time. So I just want to make that point across. I think it's an important that, uh, point that uh, Enrico made. And those of you who want to know a little more about RTI, it's an initiative in which uh, uh, the RTI Broncos group is working with Fix on. So uh, when Kathleen comes on at the end and gives the email for the Fix program office, if you want to get involved in it, just let us know because it's really, uh, it's the next step in terms of transparency when you talk about intent. Uh, Deb, uh, are there any questions out here from our, uh, from, from our audience? Uh, yeah, Tom, I think there's a question from Bill Hebert. Oh, okay. Hey, Bill. Oh, one second. Okay, Bill. Hi, guys. Hi, Tom. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of good discussion here. I think it was really, uh, you know, it's good to hear about the convergence of, you know, talking about 606, 605, 606, as people know, is, you know, historically more retail execution reporting and 606 through numerous conversations over the past few years has become more of the, um, you know, the standard for, well, including institutional trading. And I think even when we started looking at this early on, we knew there was some overlap in some of the things FIX was already doing with the tags going through. So there is um, some similarities or differences there. But I want to go back to something I think Enrico, you had said, and maybe David, you touched on too, was, you know, who really will benefit from 606? I think, what, you know, as Brian and and uh, Ari and others and Rosalind said, you know, I think what we've been doing with the execution venue reporting provides a great deal of benefit to the larger institutions uh, like some of you. Um, is 606, you know, implementable um, in, in a similar way or are, you know, institutions like registered investment advisors and hedge funds looking to adopt more of the fixed way of doing things? I guess, is there any kind of overlap there? That's the question I'm asking. Go ahead. Anybody can take that if you wish. I, I guess, David, with your clients, you must have a lot of like medium-sized institutions as well, right? I, I mean, I, I like to say that 85% um, of the tier one banks use Fidesa software. So we, we do go okay. up and down the stack, but you're absolutely right. Across, yeah. uh, I don't know what it is at the moment, 200 plus brokers, we yeah. have a wide range. And, you know, the brokers are driven fundamentally by servicing their clients and they want to provide an extremely good quality of execution as well as quality of service to their clients, both being important. And as they automate, one of the challenges they have is differentiation because when you automate something, everyone gets mm -hmm. the same service. So mm -hmm. how do you respond to the fact that the intent of a client may be more complex than a VWAP? And that drives a challenge both in uh, processing their orders, but also discussing afterwards the performance of those orders. Mm -hmm. At the level of 606 specifically versus the fixed tags, the way I think about it, and um, I might be a little simplistic here, happy to be corrected by anyone, is that the advantage or the direction we're moving in, 606 is just a step in that direction, is looking at not just the uh, trades, but looking at the routes, even if the routes don't actually result in a trade. And looking at the, uh, ideally the market data in more detail around the routes, although I think we all know market data permissioning has a whole complexity in our, in our industry. So briefly around 606 and um, the fixed messages, my belief the difference is, are, are we capturing all the route events or are we capturing the, just the trade events? And, and I understand why Project Bronco is different and I'm looking yeah. forward to learning more about it. Great, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, 
I think we're um, just about out of time, Deb is telling me, and I know we have other questions, but uh, just a final question for the, uh, uh, for the panel, right? Uh, uh, lots been done, you know, in terms of uh, the automation in this area, right? And as Enrico pointed out, you know, the overall intent and uh, uh, the, uh, what, what do you call them, Enrico? The zero, the zero routes, the, uh, uh, you know, the places where you're out to and uh, never get executed. That's pretty important to know, right? Um, looking out a year from now, where do you see the um, expansion, if you would, in overall transparency? And if each of you could just give a short answer to that, uh, I'd appreciate that. And whoever, uh, Enrico, maybe we just start with you. You know, uh, year out, where do you see the increase in transparency? I, um, I think the increased transparency is going to be what we're going to do is kind of mimic what you see in Silicon Valley and how, how we collect data over uh, smart smartphones is a distributed network of data that gets put into the cloud and accessed uh, through encryption and uh, cryptographic keys that correlate uh, a, a, a initial message that can collect all the data and all the hops. I think it was mentioned, you know, as far as from an OMS perspective, if you have multiple hops, uh, the, the data gets distorted, whether it's timestamps uh, or if it's different intentions that gets distorted as it goes downstream. So I think you're gonna see a lot more uh, um, synchronization of data and therefore the, the usage of that for automation is, is going to drastically improve that, that capacity. Hey, anyone else? I would just add to that, yeah. I think simple access to data is also critical. So not just the collection of the data, but making it trivial for um, buy sides and brokers to be able to access that data and make use of it. Okay. Yeah, I agree with I fully that. Agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, Brian, fully agree with David. I just want to say I will fully agree with him. I'm making it easy to access. <laughs> Yeah, because then yeah, uh, gonna... if it's not used, then it's not really helpful, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, say the, you know, we, we're here speaking as, you know, from representatives of fairly large sized firms, and we have a lot of resources to, to do that. And so, um, you know, obviously smaller sized firms to make use of that data, it's, it's a considerable challenge. And so the easier it is to store and maintain that data, or sorry, store and access that data, you know, the better off. Uh, they're going to be and you know the more likely they are to, to use that data so the, the work that Enrico's doing with RTI I think is taking steps in that direction and to the extent that RTI like you mentioned about the hops that's always been one of our concerns is we're not really sure you know if we're seeing the uh, you know reflected properly what happened in those hops and, and especially the timestamp in particular that Enrico's mentioning like when did, did that transaction actually take place so if initiatives like RTI can improve the data we're already receiving, you know, on transact timestamps and, and the, uh, you know, place of execution and that sort of thing, then uh, I think that's, you know, the next frontier is, can we improve this data even more than we already have? You know, and I think, you know, just, I just want to add, and that's why it's critical that uh, all the data has to be really stored in the cloud, because especially from an OMS perspective, if you, you if you're trying to consume all this data, um, I mean, that's why there's EMSs, OMSs, and OM, OM EMSs are it's challenging because, you know, if you're running EMS with all this data, it's, it, you know, the, the overhead capacity of processing that data and then transmitting it in some sort of, uh, of GUI and visualization, it's, it's impossible. But if it's stored off-site and then accessible to anyone, right, uh, that really makes a change, right? And, and I'm sure there's some brokers that have a leading advantage and, and, and you know, they're going to be resistant of this because now any third party that you give access to can consume that data, you know, whether it's 606 or anything, um, and it just becomes a, a question of it's machine-readable data and you're creating an API and, um, and pulling it into whatever uh, system that you that you want, whether it's OMS or or your own internal proprietary system. Okay. So, Ari, you get the last word. Yeah, I mean, I, I, in terms of where we are a year from now, I mean, obviously, the the RTI that Enrico is pushing uh, and driving is is the is going to be the biggest change 
in in the space um, from a transparency standpoint. Um, you know, obviously, I echo the sentiments around accessibility and in, in, um, in terms of simplicity and also being available. Um, you know, so like I said earlier, we're looking forward to working uh, working on that initiative and, and, and trying to move forward with it. I think that's that's going to be the biggest change. And again, it'll be interesting to see how it gets adopted. And, um, and Enrico raises a concern as well around just sort of protecting uh, intellectual property that goes along with the routing intent. And that's, and that's a factor that needs to be considered as well as part of this. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly this, is good. this, this initiative is, uh, is one that's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out over the next year. That's great. Well, thanks to the panel. That was a wonderful panel. Thanks, uh, Harry, uh, Rosalind, Enrico, uh, David, and, uh, and Brian. Uh, and uh, let me uh, uh, and turn this over to Kathleen Callahan, who runs the uh, FIX, uh, FIX group. Great. Thanks, Tom. And uh, thanks again to all of the panelists. Appreciate your, your insight and expertise on these issues. And I think Throughout the webinar, we heard probably every single panelist mention the importance of transparency, which is really one of the hallmarks of FIX, right? Uh, increased transparency, providing that, greater efficiencies, lower costs and risks. Um, and FIX is able to deliver these benefits to the industry uh, through collaboration on our working groups, addressing topical business and regulatory issues for the, for the, um, for the electronic trading community. So uh, one of the groups that was mentioned on this call as well was the Execution Venue Working Group. Uh, it provides consistency on how brokers report the buy side to the buy side information about tax 2930 and 851. Uh, they just recently uh, released and updated Execution Venue Reporting uh, recommended practices focused on the uh, impact that MIFID was having on whether executions were principal or agency. Uh, Brian Lees has done a podcast on this talking about the recommended practices in general and the updates uh, that were done to the recent publication. So we'll make sure that that comes out uh, in a thank you note to everybody so you can listen in on that. And Brian, I think uh, Enrico has given the Execution Venue Working Group their marching orders. Looks like there's some clarity on 851 we can work on, so we'll make sure we get that on the agenda. Uh, so one of the other groups that we just launched was the Equity Business Practices Working Group, focused on automating manual processes, utilizing open industry standards, and one area that group will be focusing on will be the RTI, as Enrico talked about, uh, the Routing Transparency Initiative, and identifying appropriate fixed messaging for that communication. Um, our Global Post-Trade Working Group has been doing a lot of work as well, it focused on automate, driving automation further down the post-trade chain. Uh, and last year they produced recommended practices for payment messaging. This year we'll look at netting and settlement instructions. So, um, Thanks, Deb. If you can move on to the event slide. We just want to uh, make sure that if you're not involved on in our working groups and you're a member of FIX, please get involved. Uh, we, we need the participation and the insight from uh, all of our member firms. So contact the program office, fixifixtraining.org. And now Deb's displaying to you the events uh, calendar. We have a number of webinars scheduled throughout uh, August and the beginning of September. And so uh, we encourage you to continue to participate on these webinars and keep your eye on your inboxes for updated information and the event page as well on the website. We also have the EMEA Virtual Trading Conference scheduled for the 18th of September, so we'll hope we'll, we'll all see virtually see you there for that. Um, and then once again, I'd just like to thank Ion Markets for sponsoring the webinar. Uh, we appreciate that. And for everybody else, uh, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you and have a great day and stay safe.